Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Emirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Agile Development with Interns by Travis LeFure. My name is Travis LeFure. I'm here to share an experience we've had over the last year and a half with using interns uh, in our development process. Um, through the slideshow, you'll see we had a, each time we had a batch, we would take a picture of it to include with that. Okay, let's see, I have a, a 15 years of experience in software development. Uh, the last six years I've been in management, and I'm a huge proponent of Agile and what it does to help uh, us accomplish our goals and provide value to our customers. Uh, currently, I work for Eugenius uh, Technologies. Uh, we're creating a, an emergent technology in the banking industry. It's called video banking. Uh, basically, you go up to an ATM, push a button, and you can actually talk to a live teller and perform your transactions with that. Prior to that, I worked for a company called In Contact, which is where this experience comes from, and I've worked for them for the last six years. Um, so I was uh, given an opportunity uh, with a, a local university called Newmont. Um, uh, they've been around for about four or five years and part of their curriculum is that you have to take uh, two uh, quarters of an internship. And in this internship, depending on how many credits you're going to do, you're going to do between four uh, up to eight hours every day for a ten week period of time. And they have uh, agreements with companies throughout uh, the state of Utah and then several in California to take on between uh, four to maybe sometimes up to ten interns at a time and put them on different projects. And so this challenge was interesting because how do we bring on board an entirely new team, train them, teach them, bring them up to speed so that they can be productive and give the company some value and at the same time give value back to those interns so that they can take something from that experience that would either enhance their skill set, make them more profitable when they go out looking for work, that they can have some experiences that they can relate to and say, hey, I've done this, I've done that, and they'll get a better starting position with where they go. Um, and can you really get value out of a group of interns? You know, it's interesting. I've, I saw the first batch and I said, man, those kids are out of high school. What are they doing here, you know? They look so young and what they're doing, and they have a lot of energy, and they're excited, and they're just out there doing it, uh, getting into the work, but you got to focus them and help them to understand how teams work together, understand the agile process, and how to work together as a team. And so my mission was to be able to take this group and help them to do that. The same concept that I'll be talking about here actually applies to new development teams. Uh, within Contact, we grew the company from about five developers to about 45 with the supporting staff of QA, project management, uh, different people like that. We went up to about 80 people in total in a very short period of time. So it was interesting as we did this process, we were able to learn from it and apply the, what we've learned, the ahas, to our new teams as well. Why did we do um, Internships, well, because we were growing so fast, we wanted a, a recruiting tool. We wanted to try before we buy and be able to take the rock stars from each internship group and say, okay, let's bring this person on, let's bring that person on. Over the course of my time in contact, we've hired over, I think, 26 uh, Newmont students from that process. Not only just in our development side, but also our professional services and our tech support, uh, depending on the different skill sets. In addition, it's a great thing to have sort of a methodology lab. So if you don't know if a new concept would work, this is a great place to try it because the, uh, the cost is not as high. Um, we paid, uh, we contributed 8000 a quarter to uh, uh, in, uh, tuition and different fees for the students to be part of their new work program. <coughs> Okay, so when we started this, we, we said, okay, we're going to set some ground rules for how to go about this. First off, we're going to use Scrum. We were already uh, 
using uh, Agile and the, the Scrum process before. He says, okay, we're going to use the same process with them. We're going to take the time to do it right and invest. So the theory was if we invest in the interns, in the processes, in the standards that we put together, and each iteration we consistently invest in that, that it's going to get easier and easier to train these new developers. And we'll get more and more value from that. So we're going to say, you know what, we're not going to get caught up into it. We're going to take the time and invest in it. Uh, we're going to create an onboarding process that would include uh, standards. A lot of companies have what they call maybe a developer handbook, where they document, all right, this is how we go about business. So we were going to invest in that. We were also going to invest in company unique design patterns. I find it very interesting. A lot of people know about design patterns. They talk about it. But rarely do I see them actually used. The other aspect of design patterns is people don't realize that every company has their own design patterns. How does that company do their prep, right? How does that company uh, interact with their database, with the DAO? How do they do their window services? Is there a certain way that they've found that works really great? How do they do redundancy? You know, all companies have these design patterns and the tribal knowledge holders within the company have that knowledge. So our goal was we're going to document the ones that we're going to use so that each time we have a new group come on, we can train them, all right, this is how we do CREV, this is how you do data access layer, this is how we go about doing unit tests, this is how we go about building our software so that they can get some of the ground rules up front and then hopefully then there's a, a better dialogue of value there where we're talking about, okay, now what about this, what about that, okay? Continuous integration. Prior to this uh, process, we never had continuous integration in contact. And so this is an opportunity towards the methodology lab to say, hey, let's build continuous integration. We're going to take uh, cruise control, uh, we're going to set it up, get it so it's building. Uh, we're a .NET shop, so it's pretty simple to do that. And then we'll actually have it call our unit test, create up some sandboxes for our databases, and, and have fun with that. And then the other item was, we're only going to train for what is needed. So we knew, based on the team that came in, all right, you're going to be doing web development. So let's only take the standards that apply to web development, the design patterns that apply to web development, let's just teach them that, and not anything else. The next team that comes in, okay, maybe you're going to do a Windows service. So let's take now the pieces that are related to that and teach them that. That shortened the onboarding program when we first did it, because we would do their 10-week period of time each quarter, and we did um, probably about eight of them in total. Um, when we first did it, it took me about two weeks to train and bring this team on board, which I've already burned through a good portion of my time. But as we got better at this, I could train a full team in about three days for whatever the project was, which was a huge uh, benefit to be able to get going on the project. And then in each iteration as we do this, we're going to update the process. We're going to take the time and um, improve it and document that process. Okay, so through our iter iterations, what did we learn? What were the ahas as we're going through this and again and again and again? One of the, the neatest ahas was the idea of a milestone. Now, this is not the milestone that you traditionally have where, all right, we get to this point, we've completed this project, we're done with phase one, phase two. The milestone was really to say, what I wanted to do is get the team to act as a team. And the problem was with a lot of the other development teams is that we were going so fast we're creating technical debt in our product that by the time we got ready to release it, it was a pain. It would take us, we had one release that we estimated cost us a half a million dollars just to release it. I mean, that's huge, okay? Because it, it took about half of our development resources to go in to fix the technical debt, all of the management pieces, the delay, all of it, it was horrible. And so, the concept of the milestone was that we're going to pick a point in time, whatever it is, that the entire team is going to say, we are done. That it's coded, it's QA, it's documented, everybody signs off, we've met the acceptance criteria of those user stories, it is good. So what happens when you do that, so we're doing a, a four-week sprint, and we'd set a milestone either in a week or in a two-week period, and the whole team would get to that, and some members were done with their work, other members were not. So we would have the other members help the other team members finish their work. Or maybe we have to do QA. So we had the whole team jump on QA. The point was we came to a point where 
Everybody finished everything, so everything was good. It gave opportunity for team members to work with each other. It gave opportunity for the team members to, to work in the QA area, which was great because then they understood what it was like. So the next time they develop software, they may make it a little bit better or they'll communicate better to the QA people. But at that point in time, we would not move on until everything was good. And what we did by doing that is that our product always worked. The continuous integration was a huge help for that. The other thing we did was uh, pass the knowledge on. A lot of times developers are known for just throwing the finished work over to QA and say, here you go, test it, make it good. What we did is I required every developer to create a dev to QA document. And the rules was, it has to have at least one sentence on there, it has to be a piece of paper, and you have to give it to the QA guy, and the QA guy has to say, got it, understand it. So I don't care for how much you put on this document, the point is you have to have a sit down interaction with QA, you have to write up something that the QA person is willing to accept, show them how to test it, show them what you were thinking, give them ideas of different ways to go about it, and uh, then certify this document and hand it off. So I didn't care what was in the document, I just cared that the process happened. And that was great because it caused a lot of the developers to sort of say, well, wait a minute, this isn't finished, this isn't what I actually needed it to be. And so they'd go back and reworked it. So there wasn't a lot of going back and forth between dev and QA due to that. The other item we used was the wiki. Um, uh, wiki is just a phenomenal thing. It's a quick way to throw up information if you guys have used wikis before. So we would capture any of the knowledge that we would gain. We started to build a knowledge base, terms, uh, the design patterns, um, troubleshooting. A lot of times these new developers would come in and the most common thing with a new developer is, how do I build your code? Okay, you maybe you have some third party components that are a little bit tricky to install. Well, every time somebody had to go through some troubleshooting, we had to create a little page about what is it you ran into, how did you solve it? So that each time they did it, when the new teams come in and they run into, oh, just go to that page right there, that's how you fix it. And we build this up over time and the thing that was interesting is that all the other development teams in Contact started using the knowledge base and the troubleshooting. And they started adding information to it. So that we didn't end up where individual teams were solving the same problem again and again. Where this knowledge was now shared, first team that solves it, documents it, now everybody has the knowledge, so that the teams now work on the next problem to solve. Okay? Teach them how to fish, pair them up. You know, it's, there's an interesting thing I'm facing right now with Eugenius, and that is that in a scrum team, not everybody can work on the, the, the number one task that they're the expert at. So if I'm a database guy, I may not be able to work on the database task every time. Okay? Depending on what's happening, I may have to go do some web development. I may have to go do some Windows service development. If the individual's qualified, let them do it. You know? So with this, it was, hey, we may have a guy that, um, so going towards this, we may have a guy that's an expert and a novice. Well, pair up the novice with an expert so that person can learn how to do that. And when you do that, the team first starts to work closely together, and second, you start to gain more and more knowledge. And so more of the team members become more capable and qualified to do the different tasks. And of course, we had code reviews within that process. Retrospective. Don't ever underestimate the value of continuous integration. I am a convert of continuous integration. It tells us how the code is built. The first thing I do whenever I have a new developer or a new team, go in and build the entire code base, everything that we deliver, and go install it on a virtual lab environment from beginning to end. So that they understand what are all the moving pieces, how do we actually build it together, so if they were given an assignment after having gone through that exercise, they would know how to build the code. They also know how the continuous integration porch should work so that they go and they change this line of code, the system builds it, tests it, and lets them know, gives them good feedback quickly. Um, and it executes the, the unit test on that. Group design. Take the time, and, it, and it's such a temptation to go fast, but take the time, have QA, have everybody who's going to touch this project be involved in the design up front. Have them understand the challenges that you go through in trying to solve the problem. Why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't we go that way? If they're involved in that conversation, you won't have those questions. 
and it will reduce uh, scope creep, it will reduce uh, the lack of focus. You know, sometimes we just spin. That is so costly as a development shop, as people are trying to figure out how are we going to get to this end result. Where if everybody's involved up front, uh, they all gain that knowledge and they know how to test it. And the QA guy who's involved in that, oh yeah, that's what they intended to do. It should be like this. Okay? Constant one-on-ones for feedback and early discovery of problems. When you have a new team or new developers, it is crucial to have almost every two weeks, if not weekly, one-on-ones for the first month or two. Understand where they're at. Understand what the challenges they're facing. Maybe they're put into a situation where they're not an expert. They don't know how to do that. The earlier you know that, the sooner you can put an expert with them and help get them through that. Or maybe you find out that their passion isn't here, but it is there. That open dialogue, move them to where their passion is. You're going to get so much more value out of doing that. Uh, clear understanding of value. User stories and acceptance criteria. I am a huge fan of the, the card. Okay? Putting the user story on the front, putting acceptance criteria on the back, having that open dialogue, it's, it's huge. And limiting the scope. If you say, okay, we're only going to do this, or we're going to do this good, and it's going to work, it's going to unit test, and we're going to have a finished product. When you do that, the team can produce that, and then all of a sudden they're done. And then they can move on to the next piece and the next piece. Too often, teams come in and they try to impress, or they're new and they want to do a lot of work. They'll end up building something like this that takes twice or three times as long. And it's a waste of time. Whereas if they just did that, they can consistently deliver value to the customer. Remember to make your technical debt payment each sprint. Um, that, is, that is so key. Because without paying that technical debt, without helping them to understand what done is, too often they just build the product and we end up in a situation like I talked about before where we had to pay the half a million to release the code. If the team accepts for what done is and then they accept for what that technical debt payment should be, maybe it's two or three unit tests per section or something. Whatever it is, define it up front and consistently pay that. Over time, by iterating through this, your momentum will speed up and it'll speed up and it'll speed up. We just had a sprint review at In Contact, and one of my uh, uh, prior coworkers told me about their team. He says, you know, I'm so excited. I've got to tell you what happened. We went up there, and In Contact, they have probably about 10 teams that are running. He says, our team was the only team that had 100% completion. Our team was the only team that had all the unit tests in place, and we completed what we committed to. Because they followed this process, and the momentum from the first time, were we faster than any other team? No way. Other teams were faster than us. Other teams had senior developers who could produce better code. But we learned from that experience. We iterated. We did retrospectives. We improved the process. We added more design patterns to it. So we actually had a library of design patterns. So when we wanted people to come in, we could have them create code very quickly. We already knew we had tested it, doing it that way. And so the speed at what these new teams could do is just phenomenal. Okay. Um, let me share one more story with you before I go to questions. Just going over my notes here because I want to make sure I don't. So I, going back to AHA, this, when you can get a team to act as a team, to help each other when someone else isn't completed but you're done, there's so much value in doing that. I had a, uh, one of my prior bosses uh, was over uh, in the gaming industry for the last 14 years. And he came into InContact and he started introducing some different processes, some different business ideas and concepts. And I was always amazed that he had such a great insight to how should we do business. And so I watched and I observed and finally I realized what it was. In the gaming industry, you build what you call a studio. And a studio will last about maybe nine months. It's almost like an entirely new business from financials to development to HR to everything. And you'll go through, you'll build a product, you'll release the product, you have to make your money back in three weeks or you're a failure. Okay, That's how the gaming industry works. So he did that. Then he did it again. Then he did it again and again and again. And what it did is it created an opportunity for him to reinvent himself. 
A lot of times as we're doing development, we get stuck into just trying to make the deadlines and meet it. And we don't have any of these, these uh, time spans of breaks where we're able to sit back. And it's almost like if you were able to go to a new job between every sprint, you would redo the way you did things. You'd change a few things, you'd tweak it. But if we're just always at the same company just moving forward, you don't reinvent yourself that often. And so he was able to do that and learn and sort of fine tune the process. The same thing with these interns is that every 10 weeks was a whole new group. So we get to reinvent ourselves. We get to learn from what we did. And so I, the aha I'd share with you is as you're doing your work, if you can somehow create an artificial break and really have an opportunity to reinvent yourself. Now the retrospective is supposed to be a, a vehicle for that. However, I think we get into the habit of the retrospective. Yeah, sort of like this. Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah, maybe we should do this. You know, we're not really into it. So if we can make that retrospective work like that, then um, you're going to see a lot of value from that, where we're willing to really look at it and say, what do we need to fix? And, then, and doing it that often, the retrospective probably isn't good, but every now and then, maybe once a quarter, would be uh, very beneficial. So, any, any questions? Actually, just touching upon retrospectives. Um, so when we have retrospectives, we'll, we'll list you know, what, we, what we did well, what we didn't do well, you know, what we could improve on, and then we just kind of forget about it. Mm -hmm. you know, we put a, and I, have you guys had to tackle that sort of issue where, and then all of a sudden next sprint comes up and you take a look at the stuff that you said last week, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot that I said that we needed to improve that. I'm just wondering uh, how you guys actually deal with those retrospectives and actually put things in. You know, there, there's two things that, that we've done. One is in the wiki, we capture the retrospective, okay? So in your scrums, maybe once a week, you can go over that retrospective and say, hey guys, this is what we talked about. Are we still on track for what we said we were going to do? Um, the second thing, and not necessarily tied to the retrospective, but that helps to, to sort of reinfuse focus, is we do what we call product backlog grooming, where we get together for one hour every week with everybody, and we go over our product backlog. And in that, we'll take whatever, uh, either dive deep on a particular subject or whatever we need to talk about to ensure that we have the right focus. And so that activity also lends itself to some of those discussions. Oh yeah, remember we said we weren't going to do this. Let's do that because we have this work that's coming up. So, okay. Any other questions? Yeah, mostly from, from an administrative standpoint. How did you deal with non-performing interns? And did you have- Brutal honesty. And then do you have any leverage over the grade? Did you assign <laughs> grades? Did you provide some kind of feedback to, to, to the nuance? Uh, I would fail them. Okay. So if I said Jack is an F, you'd get an F. Uh, if they weren't active, because one of the things that a lot of the other companies that do this and uh, say this kindly, sort of they bring them in, say, here's a project, go do something. Mm -hmm. And more than likely, they're going to throw away whatever work they do. Right. That's not how we approached it. Yeah. You're here. It's going to be extremely hard. You're going to require to work hard. And we're going to put whatever you build into production. So if you're not cutting it, I will kick you out very quickly. However, we will have many dialogues prior to me saying you're out. And I'll be very honest with you. I got known by a lot of the developers in the company and of the student body that I was very brutally honest. But I would say, you know what? You're not cutting it. You're not doing this. And this is why. So, what you need to do, what I would suggest, is these different things. Now, you pick what you want to do, but you need to fix this problem. And I'll help you however I can. I'll, you know, we got other people who can sit down with you, help you with this. We can pair you up with an expert. We're going to give you the opportunities to succeed, but it's up to you to succeed. And if you still don't succeed, you're out. So, what was your attrition rate? I had, um, I only had one student I almost kicked out. And phenomenal turnaround. As a matter of fact, I had many phenomenal turnarounds in the students because I told them straight. I had them cry in front of me, and, and then they, uh, they they changed their habits. And I had one student where the faculty says, "What did you say to him? What do you mean? Because he is applying himself in all his classes now. He's stepping up. One of the things that's a good motivator is at Newmont, they they go about ninety thousand in debt for their education." And they start to realize the reality. I'm about to graduate, and I'll tell them, I would not hire you, nor would I ever recommend you, because you can't do this. But I can tell you what you could do 
to be hired if you really want to work at it. So. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everybody.